today we have amongst us someone who has been a civil servant from even before anyone in the room was born um, his contribution to public service has been exemplary and highly commendable as someone who started his journey working in the environment and water resource management in gujarat to now secretary general of the national human rights commission he has experienced it all uh, he worked for a long time in water sanitation and hygiene public health sector and has been instrumental in promoting investment to create opportunities for all he was a member of the core team managing the covid-19 pandemic caused by coronavirus in the country sir's experience is not only restricted to human rights or water management but also extends to various other aspects of public welfare uh, sir served as the director general of the national center of good governance and was also working as the secretary to the lokpal of india he is the founder and mission director of the human this water supply scheme introduced by the government of india the jal jeevan mission to ensure clean tap water to every rural home presently as the Ge secretary general of the national human rights commission of india sir is also responsible for the protection and promotion of human rights of all sir has been widely recognized for his contributions ladies and gentlemen please welcome mr bharat lal thank you thank you all very much thank you uh sir i would like to start with my first question with your permission um your journey of course has been nothing short of inspiring you've achieved so much across fields and it ranges from water resource management to human rights so how did you find your calling for civil services in the end if you want to live a meaningful life it means you have to find a purpose of life and there can't be any better purpose than basically working for people working for others we have got a 5000 year old history and if you see all people you know who are considered you know uh, great or we revere them or we try to emulate them actually they have worked for others They're starting from lord gautam buddha or mahatma gandhi or so many freedom fighters or so many you know politicians and public servants so end of the day i think for youth like you you are doing a great work great work basically you are impacting people's lives same inspiration i got that civil service is offering an opportunity basically you know to contribute meaningfully to impact and change people's lives make it better and i think this is the whole philosophy whole purpose and whole approach towards civil services my next question revolves around equality and uh, human rights because um, so equality is essential for any thriving democracy and uh, in india we have made significant progress in reducing discrimination across um, however there are cases of human rights violations uh, based on gender or caste or other economic factors which are still prevalent so what are your thoughts about the current state of equality in our nation so first and foremost i think we all know that india is one country it's a clear you all through empathy and compassion if you see since beginning in india four religion were born and all four religion hindu is buddha is jain is sikh is all that is non violence so first thing we have to understand that violence are terrorism or war are the biggest biggest impediment in enjoying your human right so that is the first step. second you have seen that india basically it not only tolerate different view point or different religious people or different culture but we basically assimilate we accept it and assimilate it. so if you see the three religion who came from west asia christianity islam and judaism they were accepted in this country take zoroastrianism you know you know evolved in iran but it flourished in india only so second point is that in last 5000 years the society has evolved where empathy and compassion instead of tolerance is acceptance for all shade of life all kind of people all religion and third most important part is that we believe in basically seeing that other people are happy our society is we don't live for only for ourselves you know it's not a very very self centered and materialistic society society basically is see most of the people you know social reformers or you know all those who work basically they try to improve others lives you know. so in this context if you see in last 200 300 years that some kind of problem arose with some injustices with women especially widows or child labor or child marriage or you know, those kind of some kind of discussion on caste and creed but see our freedom fighters starting from 17th 18th 19th century they worked on the issue raja ram mohan rao he worked on it ishwar chand vidyasagar he worked on it gokhale lokman tilak take mahatma gandhi they worked on it. 
Mahatma Gandhi, for him, independence was important. But equally important was that there should be no discrimination against scheduled caste. And if you see that preamble, equality, justice, liberty and fraternity. fraternity. Why fraternity has been added? Because we the people, for us, this fraternity is very, very important. So we have to see the spirit of the constitution that not only equality, justice and liberty, but fraternity is very important. It's not only the government. We the people have decided that we will have sense of belonging with each other. You know, that is that. And one of the most beautiful thing is that in this country, under our constitution, Supreme Court is the custodian of fundamental right. Yes. Under Article 32, anybody, it is my fundamental right to approach the court to get justice. I think many of you might be pursuing law. And as you know, Article 226 of uh, our constitution, high courts have got the power to issue writs. So what it says that this, the human right, when it comes to civic and political rights, it is well protected in the form of fundamental law. But now comes the cultural and socioeconomic rights. So I think the inkling or the framework has been given under directive principle of state policy. That state or government, what will be its endeavor, what will be its goal? Same thing, equality, justice, liberty, and under directive principle of state policy, certain duties and responsibilities has been given that a state has to perform. Now, after this, you see, over the plus 75 years, take one example, to protect various vulnerable groups and marginalized section of society, various commissions have been constituted. So National Commission for Scheduled Caste and National Commission for Scheduled Tribe is constitutional body. It has been created under the constitution. Thereafter, you know, see, statutory bodies, yeah. National Commission for Women, National Commission for Protection of Children's Rights, National Commission for Economic uh, Backward Classes, you know, for minorities, you know, and Commissioner for Disabilities. So these kind of organizations have been created, institutions have been created. More importantly, in 1993, National Human Rights Commission has been created. All these seven bodies, they are part of National Human Rights Commission, they are represented here. And these commissions also have their counterpart in states, various state, state commission for women, state commission for you know, various women. You know. Similarly, National Human Rights Commission also has its counterpart in a state, it is known as the State Human Rights Commission. National Human Rights Commission has a concept of what you call special reporters and special monitors. Basically, special reporters are allotted states and special monitors are basically looking after subject. And National Human Rights Commission has developed a mechanism where basically anybody for his own violation or even for somebody else, you can file any complaint for any person. Or more importantly, any form, online, through email, through post, you know, you need not to be represented by a lawyer. You need not to come to Delhi. In fact, most of the time, with this commission goes to states basically and hold open hearing or camp sitting basically to get complaints. These human rights are concerned in this country. A, as I said, there is a cultural concept, empathy and compassion. B, constitutional aspect, fundamental rights. C, if you see statutory backing. D, proper working. A kind of framework is there to protect and promote right. And lastly, if you see last 10 years, what is being done actually? No one is left out. To improve the quality of life, every family should have a house. Every family should have a clean tap water, have toilet, have electricity, have access to health care, have banking account. You know. So human right is seen in a very holistic manner where state and various these institutions are working in partnership to ensure that the human right of each and every individual is protected and promoted. And lastly, there is a special focus on improving the human right. Our living conditions are basically the most vulnerable marginalized section of society. I think the scenario is emerging much better. Day by day, there is a more youth like you are getting involved in basically protection and promotion of human right. There are people who are willing to take up cases of human rights violation on somebody else's behalf. So this kind of synergetic action actually is changing the human rights condition in this country.
I think before we go ahead, if you permit, I would like to open the floor to questions uh, from the audience also. How has NHRC been involved in the advocacy and outreach of human rights under your leadership? Please understand that uh, National Human Rights Commission is basically a multi-member body, has a chairperson whose uh, rank and pay of uh, Chief Justice of India and five members basically who are at the rank of uh, judges of Supreme Court. Yes. And I am um, Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer. So one thing I think Commission understand that mm -hmm. uh, is very clear that we have to work with people various segment of society to protect and promote human rights. For to do this job, outreach is the most critical aspect and this outreach is done in various manners. Take we are having internship program, online internship as well as in-person internship. So where these young men and women basically they are brought here are online, they are connected and they are sensitized by various dimensions of human rights. We again, you know, sponsor and help academic institutions, NGOs to have seminars, symposia, conferences, you know, on various aspects of human rights, various dimensions of human rights. Thirdly, we work with NGOs and human rights defenders, civil society organization, community-based organization, you know, voluntary organization on protection and promotion of human rights. Fourthly, I think we reach out to various campuses actually. We, we very proactively reach out to various campuses and try to our chairperson and members, myself including and my other colleagues, we will go to campuses and basically try to sensitize people and young people, especially on various dimensions of, of human rights. So our outreach activity is multifold and we believe that if we work basically with various segments of society, I think collectively we can do much better job. And National Human Rights considers NGOs and human rights defenders as critical key partner in this endeavor. And lastly, as an outreach, we also work with government actually. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Good morning, sir. I'm Akanksha Bharate and I'm from Nakhun Maharashtra. My question to you is, from Kautilya's Arthur Shastra to India's con Indian constitution, India has tremendously changed over the years. What are the biggest changes you expect to see in the future and how can the future aspirants and leaders in this room make the most of the opportunities that are coming there? See, if we, if you see at your generation, I think you will admit that uh, when the country became independent, there were many, many more challenges, different kind of challenges. Take food shortage. We will say there was no vaccination program basically. Every year, IMR, MMR, you know, so many indicators were there. Were there. So I think the whole focus is basically improving the quality of life of people. And this pride creates its own opportunities. When the focus is on improving quality of life, it means you have to have basic infrastructure. You have those kind of public service delivery. It means you will use means, let's say digital technology. It means for improving public services. All these things are basically are creating opportunities. The second dimension is that new issues are emerging. Maybe 50 years or 75 years back, nobody realized that environment degradation or climate will emerge as a challenge. But today, climate issues and environmental issues are becoming a challenge as you see cyclone, drought, flood. So these are the areas which are the emerging areas, where basically it also provides an opportunity to youth, for you to work. Now the next dimension which is coming up that uh, earlier, most of the economic activities used to be in government's hand public sector undertaking, big factories, big industries and you know this thing. Now private sector is having larger role. Yes, hmm? It means it also provides an opportunity but, but it means private sector has to conform to certain standards. So when it comes to ESG, whether it's environment or sustainability or governance, they have to conform to this thing. But more importantly, the National Human Rights Commission has seen this issue that our young workforce, young men and women who are joining private sector, it must be ensured that they should not work in very stressful conditions. They should not develop mental health issues. So these are the areas where basically for people like you have to focus. It provides an opportunity, both that A, to improve the conditions and we avail these opportunities to address those emerging challenges are already those challenges who have already emerged and we are facing, you can see many, many challenges. So in a new and emerging world, 
I think this is one aspect which we have to keep in mind. And lastly, please always keep in mind that for you, your pitch to play is not your village, not your district, not your state, not only India, but it's a global. You are not working or you are not going to work at local level or you are competing at the local level. End of the day, you have to compete at the global level. That we must keep in mind. So it means our education, our skilling, our approach, our, our temperament, it has to be tailored in such a manner that we should be able to compete and come out in flying colors, you know, with the rest of the world. That is the way forward. So my question for you is that India's primary healthcare model is one to be followed by countries, especially of the global south. India's primary healthcare model is increasingly seen as an example for other countries, particularly in the global south. What aspects of this model do you believe are most replicable and impactful for the countries now? See, if you see the primary health care, or say health care general, you know, of this sector. So, to realize my, see, right to life is guaranteed in India and most of, most part of the world, except in few dictatorship, but uh, otherwise everywhere it is guaranteed right to life. So right to life means basically right to health, it is integral part of that. So think about the country like India, that when you have got 1.44 billion people is spread in 4,300 cities and towns, 1.8 million rural habitations, roughly 650,000 villages, it means reaching out to them and especially see the geography and, and terrain of this country, starting from Himalayas, Indo-Gangetic Plain, Central India, forested area, remote area, border area, peninsula, islands, we have those kind of situations. So A, humongous size, B, 1.44 billion population number, and C, cultural diversity. So if in this kind of country, if you are able to provide healthcare facilities or access to what I call affordable and quality healthcare, it means any part of the world can learn from Indian experience. But India's approach has been wholesome wellness, not only curative, not only treatment, not only preventive, one step further. It is wholesome wellness, basically, you know. So it means body, soul, mind, everything. But yoga meditation is what end of the day? It's basically taking care of not only your physical uh, well-being, but it's a mental well-being. The second example I would like to say is a universal vaccination program. That is one example. That government is reaching out to each and every child, in fact that he or she has to be given polio vaccine. Uh, despite all these things, somebody has developed uh, serious illness. Earlier, what it used to be? Poorer people, nowhere to go. They have to sell their house or land or something. So, present government, led by Honorable Prime Minister, Ayushman Bharat has been launched. That it has two dimensions. One, that any poor family will have 5 lakh rupees insurance. So, if they need admission, they can get it. But 70 years plus, even that ceiling has been removed. That anybody 70 plus years, you know. So see, the empathy and compassion that government or state is taking care of these vulnerable groups. Nobody need to sell his or her house or land to get health care facilities. And lastly, in this country, you have seen during COVID-19 pandemic, in roughly eight months, 2.2 billion dosage of vaccine has been administered. See the whole logistic. Vaccine is produced, is stored, it has to be sub-zero temperature, it has to be transported, bulk transfer, state level, district level, then village level, PSC level, you know. So if this country can organize this level of operation, well, <coughs> I think the whole world, our global south, they can learn how to work on a scale, how to work with speed, how to take care of the most vulnerable group of people, most vulnerable, whether it's children or aged people, 
So I think this country take TB elimination. No, this process is going on that this TB should be eliminated. Polio has been eliminated. You know now uh, leprosy like. Every year, some 100,000 cases are taking place to be eliminated. So, world can learn all these experiments which is being done. And lastly, just imagine the work is going on, what you call digital healthcare. This is the new area where basically just imagine that suppose if I fall ill, what I need it basically, I should be able to contact and talk to my doctor, my digital doctor on my phone. In the villages at PSC or CSC or village panchayat, I should be able to connect with the doctor, any doctor anywhere. So digital healthcare solution, this is going to be a way forward. If you can ensure by digital healthcare solution that 1.44 billion people are having doctor on their palm, well, our global south is a leapfrog factor. Training so much doctor, paramedic, creating infrastructure, all those things will take its own time. But for preventive healthcare, 80-90% times you require just a family physician or some doctor. And that can be done by providing digital solution. And this solution, imagine a region like Africa. Again, 1.4 billion people there, 50 odd countries remote area, infrastructure are not still, you know, need to be developed. So in those areas, basically, this digital solution, digital healthcare can ensure primary healthcare to all. Affordable, accessible, and quality. All three things can be taken care of. So this is the lesson which India is basically, has done it in this country, doing it, and sharing it with Global South. India is already sharing it. Take vaccine. During that time, COVID vaccine, we shared with everybody. So these are the way forward where basically what you call India approach, that whole world is one family. You are translating your ancient Indian wisdom or philosophy into action. We don't live only for ourselves. At local level, we live for family, we live for society. And when you consider whole world as one family, one family, well, whatever you have, you have to share. You know? This approach of India is helping a lot. So my question to you is, with over 15 crore households and more than 9 lakh schools and anganwadis now connected to tap water under the Jal Jeevan mission. So what challenges have been most significant in maintaining and ensuring the quality and sustainability of this water supplies? And what future steps are planned to address them? Clean tap water. I think we'll all agree that is the basic necessity. In the morning, if I don't have water, or in the night, I don't have water, you can realize that what kind of implication is going to have. So if in urban area we have, or in developed world, we have this kind of facility, why not our people living in villages in rural area, they can have. So it means there should not be any gap in living conditions. So the very, very first thing is that. that the Services we expect in cities, in towns, in developed world, I think our people are entitled to have those kind of services. Honorable Prime Minister has, uh, when he came in 2014, he started this thought process that A, no one is left out. Each and every individual, our family has to have basic facilities, basic amenities to, to live a quality life and B, to realize his or her are their full potential. Clean water is one of the most important, most important basic requirement to achieve this goal. Now what has been done? Rural area, government has come out with a proposal, a project, Jal Jeevan Mission, implementing that all 19.3 crore rural homes will have tap water connection. Not only tap water connection, functional household tap water connection. It started in December 2019 and now more than 15 crore household have been provided with tap water connection. I think 79% school and then what is center because children are more vulnerable. So roughly 90% in uh, schools are Anganwadi, Asham Shala having the same facility. Not only tap water, but hand washing facility, running pipe water in toilet and urinal, you know, or whatever grey water you collect and treat it and use it, or rainwater harvesting for demonstration purpose. 
But despite this COVID-19 pandemic, the work has been done with so much speed and scale. Because two, three factors. A, okay? determination of the top leadership. And second was team effort at different level. This partnership, central government, state government, panchayat, you know, civil society, public health engineer, everybody came together because this idea was very powerful. Now, if you see the future challenges, it comes from the whole functional household tap connection. It means every tap has to be functional. Functional means water has to be regular supply, certain quantity, certain quality, and with pressure. And lastly, long term means sustainability. Sustainability could be three types. A, financial sustainability for operation, maintenance, electricity, bill, you know, resource sustainability, basic water. There are 40% areas is drought prone. So in those areas, basically you need water. And third thing is system sustainability. See, there have to be people basically who are tuned to operation and maintenance. They have that kind of mindset that you are basically into service delivery, where a single minute delay or even slightest compromise in quality of water the kind of water we drink, we should be able to drink from that time. So the challenge is that we all have to get, and imagine from a muhalla level, to village level, to panchayat level, to district level, to state level, to national level, everybody has to get. That this service delivery we should ensure and take care of three aspects of sustainability. Financial sustainability, resource sustainability, and system sustainability. So this part, I would say, I will not use the word as challenge, but I would say it's opportunity. It's opportunity actually. Imagine the youth can be deployed in the whole operations everywhere. That world class service we should be able to provide. You know. So Jal Jeevan Mission is basically providing a huge opportunity for our country to become a perfectionist. End of the day, Jal Jeevan Mission, what we call challenge, I would say the opportunity is that we should learn to provide world-class service. So Jal Jeevan Mission is a kind of futuristic program which basically can change our working actually. Jain sir, so my question to you is, what was your experience like during that time and what was, what was your biggest takeaway from mission like this? <clears throat> See, let's understand that uh, in a country like ours, talk about India, so more than 40% area is basically drought prone semi-arid and arid region, okay? That is the first thing. It means water or paucity of water is a kind of limiting factor for our socio-economic development and economic growth. If water is not available, it can have tremendous adverse impact. Suppose tap water is not there, your whole work will suffer. Suppose you want to start industry or some company or something, if water shortage is there, well, it's going to have impact. There could be many, many industries which uses water. So if you see Gujarat during 2000, this uh, earthquake uh, happened on 26th uh, January uh, 2001. That point of time, for previous three years, <coughs> Gujarat was reeling under drought. And in fact, Gujarat economic growth was in negative. In fact, if situation is like this, and earthquake has happened, so whole economic scenario also you know, impacted. And at that juncture, in October 2001, Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, he took over as Chief Minister. So the first and foremost goal was, no doubt, rehabilitation, reconstruction of earthquake affected area. But the key lies in basically what you call water security. If water is available in plenty, I think your economic activities can you know, happen. So first and foremost, in Gujarat in 2001, instead of managing the problem, the approach adopted was that let's solve the problem long term. See, if there is a drought, if there is no drinking water, you deploy tanker or trains. Those, those days basically we used to deploy two trains actually, water will be transported through train, or roughly five to six thousand you know, road tankers, water will be supplied. This is the management of problem. But what is the long term solution? So in Gujarat, convert this water scarcity to water security. From water scarcity to water security, a number of steps were taken. 
n it has macro level and micro level so at village level right, you know that water is basically rainfall is there for 10 15 20 days it means this water need to be collected and stored storage can be done over the ground in ponds lakes dams reservoirs and under the ground aquifer what you call basically artificial recharge so this was the first thing that in gujarat a water conservation was made a people's movement people were involved and b you have to make your land area open defecation free because you are going to collect water from there just imagine if fecal matter you know human excreta is there and same rain water you are collecting doesn't serve any purpose so it means sanitation you have to improve and third thing is that wherever water is falling whether in your house or village or your farm just collect collect it store it and store it cleanly and fourth dimension was use it wisely intelligently and lastly at um, the gujarat was constructing at that point you know sardar sarovar project which has only delayed and this was completed canal network took place and water transfer from south gujarat to northern and western gujarat and kutch it took place so it kind of water management wise water management integrated water management instead of managing the water problem you are solving the water problem i think this holistic approach helped gujarat and result has been just imagine that in 99 2000 i was telling you that uh, growth was negative last two decades after that gujarat is basically having double digit growth imagine for few months in northern bihar and assam people are affected by drought so what you need basically that let's change this drought this problem this challenge into opportunity drought is a challenge and here flood this is also a challenge so this flood water or in cities you have seen a storm water if you are able to collect it you plan properly able to collect it store it and use it so your challenge or problem can be converted into a kind of opportunity and in country like india as i said earlier ensuring water security adequate quantity and quality of water for all sectors at every place it has tremendous potential to basically create opportunities whether in the agriculture sector or industry or services imagine tourism it will flourish if there is water you know if water is not there how can you expect that tourism will flourish or your productivity you know if you are struggling for water imagine those days in gujarat people will wait for tankers you know so for 6 hour 8 hour 4 hours they are waiting for tanker forget about going to school or going to some work so it has tremendous impact you know so my lesson in this area is that we have to ensure water security we should not allow paucity of water to become a limiting factor in our socio economic development and economic growth and it has to be people's movement in last 10 years especially in last 5 years this has been done that's an all water related subjects ministry department have been brought under one umbrella jal jeevan mission was launched swachh bharat mission had started 10 years back jal shakti abhiyan catch the rain you know all those interlinking of water interbasin of crosser completing pending projects see in a country like ours when 70% population is still dependent on agriculture 46% people are basically involved in agricultural activities but they are contributing only let's say roughly 18% of gdp you know and 85% of our water used by agriculture sector so water use efficiency in agriculture thank you sir all of us have personally taken a lot of things back today but uh, the biggest learning for today is going to be how uh, you should you know convert your challenges or problems into opportunities thank you thank you so much for doing this sir it was a lovely session thank you thank you